All right. So uh, first things first, we're just talking about you have a homework due next. I decided to make it due end of the day next Wednesday. But again, that's like a loose sort of thing. We're basically just get the exam in um, by, you know, if, if you need another day or so, just, or you not the exam, if you need the whole, if you need another day on the homework or something, just email me. And this one is, um, I'm just gonna describe the assignment. The assignment is, uh, we talked about a bunch of social psych concepts last class. And I just want you to go online and find four uh, advertisements that use one of these techniques to try to convince you to buy something and just like write up like for each one, like three to five sentences, just explaining like, this is an example of the halo effect. The halo effect is blah, blah, blah. You can see the halo effect in this advertisement because the person who is in the advertisement is beautiful. Like that's for the, and basically they're going to be graded um, pretty loosely. So as long as you're like put in effort, you'll get full credit on it. Um, so yeah, that will be due. It's officially due end of day next Wednesday. Um, yeah, I'm not going to, if you turn it in at like the next morning, I'm not going to take off points or anything. Don't stress about it too much. We won't, I mean, we're not going to go over them in class because everyone's going to have different ads. It's also kind of just like funny to see funny ads, like have fun with it. Find weird advertisements that you remember from a kid as a kid and things like that. Um, hell, it doesn't even have to be in English. I don't really care as long as like the, the ad, like the good thing about ads that use these techniques is you don't need to speak the language to know them. So use anything you want. Um, have fun with it. All right. So now we're just going to do the very exciting go over the midterm. So, all right. Now I have to share my screen again. Share screen. Midterm. All right. Nope. I, I, am I proceeding to... I may have just shared the chat, which was not what I meant to share. Okay. Shh. Share. What am I sharing right now? What is, what are people seeing? Uh, it's so the midterm, but it was like the browser okay. window itself. Okay, so there's my midterm. Okay, um, for some reason it wasn't showing me the screen. Okay, going back to share this screen. Share. All right, I see it, I've got chat. If any of you computer people have a question for me, either ask it out loud or uh, type it in the chat. I have the chat in front of me. Um, this is also gonna be the single most boring YouTube video ever for anyone who's watching in the future. And I apologize for that. Um, what's more boring than staring at an exam? All right, so uh, also because this is being recorded and I don't know how good this microphone pointing at me is for you people. Um, I don't actually know. I, I might call on somebody to give the answers, but then I'll repeat them for computer people when people say the right answer. So the first one was if you, the first set of questions was the, is this an argument? And if it's an argument, tell me what the premises and conclusions are. So number one, was it an argument? Oh, yeah. Yes, it was an argument. And what was the conclusion? Yeah, the last sentence was the conclusion. The, so if you stare at the sun for an hour, blah, blah, blah. Now, the reason that one was the conclusion is that's the one that all the other sentences work towards. So everything leading up to that point was, was a background piece that leads you to this point. And the reason that this has to be the one is none of the others. What you have here is an if A, then B, if B, then C, if C, then D. Um, wait, if A, then B, if B, then C, if C, then D, if D, then E, so if A, then E. And so the reason the last one has to be the conclusion is that it's the only one that takes something from the first sentence and something from the last sentence and everything in between were the steps along the way. So that's why it's the last sentence. If you have any uh, business, general business thing, if you have any questions and you are a computer person and you want to shoot me an email with any questions on your, uh, your own exam and you think I gave you the wrong grade or anything like that, shoot me an email. I will happily look it over. Human people, feel free to do it by email or feel free to talk to me while we're here today. Um, but that's why the final sentence was the conclusion. All right, number two um, was not an argument. This is just a description of the day. 
Number three, what was the, was it an argument? Yes, it was an argument. What was the, what was the conclusion? Therefore, yeah, the, the therefore gave it away. Fourth one, also an argument, and the first sentence was the conclusion. All the others are basically convergent premises working towards this conclusion. So four, also an argument. Doop, 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 doop. All right, this was one that people had trouble with. So I'm just going to talk through this one. This was probably the most commonly uh, gotten wrong. To be clear, though, most of the people, most everyone who lost points on these two only lost a point or two. Basically, the key was that um, an inductively valid argument, there were two parts to the definition. The first one is what's an inductive argument. And then the second part is basically what's a good inductive argument. So the correct answer for five was an inductively valid argument is an argument that draws on past experience to draw a conclusion and draws on enough past experience that the conclusion is extremely likely if the premises are true. So anything along those lines, I was pretty loose with how you worded it, but the key parts were comes from experience. And if the premises are true, the conclusions almost certainly, but not certainly true. Um, deductively valid argument, the key defining term is it's an argument where if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And that is the definition of validity. That is not the definition of soundness, which is the definition for soundness is a valid argument and all the premises are true. But the key thing is if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. That's just the definition. Another way of putting this is if the premises are true, the conclusion cannot be false. Um, if the premises aren't false, then the conclusion must be true. All of those are ways of saying the same thing, um, which leads us into part three. Was What was number seven? Was seven deductive or inductive? I should be seven. That was deductive. Yes. Seven was deductive. Some people put inductive. And I think the thing that might have thrown you was that you had to look at the little triangle on the or square on the right. But that's just what's being talked about. It's not that you're drawing on past experience to prove it. It's rather that that's just what I'm talking about in this. And was it valid? Yeah. Mm hmm. It is valid. And it is also, as actually Sack, she says, it is also sound. Yes, it is both sound and valid. And again, the reason it's valid is the definition of validity is just, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And if these premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Because if all rectangles have four sides, and the thing to the right is a rectangle, then the thing to the right has to have four sides. It can't not. Now, the fact that there are other shapes that have. Yeah, but um, can you explain one more time what makes it deductive? So what's deductive is the definition of a deductive argument is one in which you are drawing. You're not drawing on past experience. It's just the definitions of the terms. The definition of a rectangle is it has four sides and the thing to the right is a rectangle. So that's why it's deductive is you're not having to go, the last rectangle I saw had four sides, the one before that had four sides, the one before that had four sides. It's rather that just the definition of what a rectangle is. And that also the other thing is if by definition, a rectangle has four sides and by definition, the thing to the right is a rectangle, then by definition, the thing to the right has to have four sides. So the other way you can know it's deductive is that it is something where if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. That sort of validity is something that can only happen with deductive arguments. And the reason that's actually is correct that it is sound is that it is true that all rectangles have four sides. And it is true that the thing to the right is a rectangle. Now, if um, if you wanted, if you used a different font or something and the thing wasn't connected and that's the reason you said invalid, like message me and I'll give you your credit back. But like uh, the, the font I had these connected and this was a little rectangle. So, all right. So, but again, all right, number eight. Eight is the very long number of uh, premises of an inductive argument. Now, um, so this was an inductive argument, and it's an inductive argument because it's drawing on past experience to draw some further conclusion. So it's my last time taking the train will basically make it the case that the next time I'll take the train uh, or the sixth train. This one I was thinking of as valid, 
However, some people put in invalid and this isn't enough times. And you know what? I think that that's the case. Like maybe I changed my routine or something. So if I put in, if you put invalid and I took credit off, email me and I'm going to give you your credit back. If you put deductive, that I will not give credit for. But if you put inductive invalid and I took off points, let me know and I will give you those points back. Um, number nine, what was number nine? Inductive or deductive? Inductive. Now, this one was a little tricky because basically the first it only has one premise, but that first premise is about a lot of past experience. It's talking about for the past six years. For the past six years means all the times I've woken up and I've not had coffee, I got a headache. So that's a lot of past experience. It's just written in a single sentence. So this is inductive. And again, this one was definitely valid because six straight years of getting headaches like that is that is definitely a, a valid inductive now people had trouble with yes sorry to interrupt you the one that you had before i think it was question eight you said if you put inductive to let you know no if you put inductive and invalid and i took off points let me know because this was i thought of this as inductive valid but some people put inductive invalid and after thinking about it i came to the realization that you know what you can make an argument for that so if you put inductive and invalid and I took off points, contact me. So what if, if you, you put, if you didn't lose any points, you don't have to contact me. I'm not going to like steal your points at this point. What if, if you, put you like inductive with an yeah, inductive argument, um, the argument is valid, but you put it's not sound. Uh, if you put not sound, it was irrelevant because it was an inductive argument. So okay. basically if you put, if you put that extra information, technically speaking, it doesn't even apply, but I didn't take off any points. Um, soundness only applies to deductive arguments. So okay. if you put it, I just crossed it out and said, you didn't need this, but I'm not taking off points for it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so number 10, this one was the one that people had trouble with. Uh, this was a deductive argument. And the key here is to remember your definition of validity. What was the definition of validity? Well, the definition of validity is just if the premises are all true, the conclusion must be true. That's all validity means. It's got nothing to do with whether the premises are actually true. It's got nothing to do with whether the conclusion is actually true. It's all if the premises were true, if you assume they are, then can the conclusion be false? And so given that definition, can this be is this valid? And the answer is, yes, this is valid. Why? Because if it's the case that someone is a person and they live in Brooklyn, then it is necessarily true. And it's, blah, blah, blah. if it's true that someone is a person, they live in New York, then they live in New, or if they live in Brooklyn and are a person, they live in New York. If that's true, and it's true that someone is a person, um, it's, sorry, it's invalid. I think I said valid. This has to be invalid. It's invalid. Because if a person, if the first one is true and the second one is true and the third one is true, it's still possible that the conclusion is false. Sorry if I misspoke. This was invalid and has to be invalid. And once it's invalid, it's also unsound. So as long as you put invalid, I think I didn't take off points because, I mean, if you said invalid and then said sound, you lost points because that's impossible. But this was an invalid argument and it's an invalid argument because even if it's true that someone is a person and they live in Brooklyn, then they live in New York and someone is a person and they live in New York, it's not a guarantee that they live in Brooklyn. They could live in Staten Island or Queens or any of the other. So this one was invalid. Um, all right. On to these next ones. All right. Number 11. What was the correct answer for number 11? Four was the correct answer. Yes. Now, why was it four? So let me take a sip of water. So the key to realizing it was four is the difference between a um, serial premise and a linked premise. So remember, this little arrow in four where the Y and Z are connected, that signals a linked premise. And what a linked premise means is that in the nature of the argument, two things are working together. And they're working together in a way where what this is saying is that X, Y by itself is not an argument for X, Z by itself is not an argument for X. And what I'm talking about right here is, is the bottom half of, of option four. This is saying that 
Z y is not by itself an argument for X. Z by itself is not an argument for X, but Y and Z together are an argument for X. What three by contrast is saying is that Z by itself is an argument for Y and Y by itself is an argument for X. And when we look at what the sentences say, so what four is saying here is that if I just bought a car and whenever a person buys car, they have to get insurance, those together prove that I have to get insurance. That's what the bottom half says of Y, Z, and X. By contrast, what three is claiming with this structure is that if a person buys a car, then they have to get insurance is a reason to conclude that I just bought a car, which is not the case. So that's why it can't be three and why it has to be four. Um, it can't be two because V isn't the conclusion and it can't be Z because there's not just the, again, the same thing of um, serial premises. And also this is one with no convergent premises. You don't have completely separate reasons, but that brings us on to number 12. Uh, any questions at this point? Anyone in the room or on the line? Are we doing okay? Yeah, can you explain okay. one? Because my thought process, for example, was like, Okay, so like I put Z. As, you mean I an put, eleven? Yeah, eleven. Okay. I put Z as the conclusion. If a person buys a card, and they have to get insurance. And then I was looking at everything else as like separate oh, okay, reasons yeah, that yeah. lead into each other. So okay, so this is the this is sorry I, I misspoke before. It's it's Z is not the conclusion. Now why isn't I said before that it couldn't be two because V is not the conclusion, but that's wrong. V is the conclusion. And why is it that V is the conclusion as opposed to Z being the conclusion? Well, if you actually look at this, what number one is claiming is that I just bought a car is a by itself a reason to conclude that if a person buys a car, they have to get insurance, which isn't the case. I just bought a car is just a statement of fact. I just bought a car would be proof that I bought something. It would be proof that I'm now not carless. But by itself, it does not prove the case that if a person buys a car, they get insurance. And what because this is why being a convergent premise for Z, what it's saying is I just bought a car is a reason to conclude that whenever a person buys a car, then they have to get insurance. But what the actual reason that if a person buys a car, they have to get insurance is like the nature of US law or the nature of international law. It's got nothing to do with the fact that I just bought a car. So why V has to be the conclusion is V is the thing that is following from the other sentences. That I have to pay a monthly fee to the insurance company is what is following from the fact that I now have to get insurance and whenever a person gets insurance, they have to pay a monthly fee. Does that make sense of why it's V and not Z? See, I, I mean, it makes sense when you're explaining, but I was thinking about it from a, from a perspective, like, like, like you said, U.S. law. Like, so for me, when I bought my car, I have to get insurance. I'm going to drive the but car. That is true, but... Is the fact that you bought the car the reason you have to get the insurance? Is that what causes it? If there was no U.S. law, would buying the car by itself be reason to get insurance? Well, no, not with the law. No, not, not without yeah, the law. So, so that's the key is that it's the law plus buying the car that makes it the case that you have to get the insurance. So that's why it can't be. And also the other reason is this is also saying now I have to get insurance is a reason to think that if a person buys a car, then they have to get insurance. But this is something that follows from the fact that if a person buys a car, they have to get insurance, not the other way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Number 12. Number 12, the, this one was a little tough. The correct answer was one. The reason the correct answer had to be one and not six is that what six is saying is that by itself, W is not, is, an, is not an argument for Z. It's saying cars are pretty is not a reason to buy a car. And it's saying that by itself, cars are fun is not a reason to buy a car. And cars are convenient, doesn't even count as an argument for buying a car. That's what six is claiming. But in truth, these are three separate individual reasons. When they work together, they're better but if by themselves, they still count as an argument. So X is an argument to think you should buy a car. Y is an argument for why you should buy a car. W is an argument for why you should buy a car. So that's why it's, it has to be one and not six. It cannot be two or five because cars are pretty is not the conclusion. It's not that cars are convenient is what makes cars pretty. And then it, it's not three because 
W and Y are not reasons to think cars are fun. It's not that cars are convenient and cars are pretty that make them fun. They're rather a separate idea from this. And for the same reason, it can't be four because W is a separate reason to buy a car. W is not a reason to think cars are fun. Cars are pretty isn't just a reason that cars are fun. Like you can have pretty things that are no fun. Um, yes, Kosi says they're all separate premises leading to this collective conclusion. They're not a group of premises working together. Now, number 13 was also uh, a bit of a tricky one. Now, the correct answer to 13 was five. It was not, um, so five is the correct answer. Now, why is it five? Well, the first thing to note is it can't be one because cars are dangerous is not the conclusion. Um, cars are dangerous is a reason to think cars are very bad. It's not the other way around. Then, um, so that's one out of there. It has to, it cannot be two or three because again, it has to do with our linked premises versus convergent premises. By itself, the fact that cars are dangerous counts as an argument to think cars are very bad. So the reason it can't be Z, uh, Z is that Z is claiming that cars are dangerous and cars are killing the environment are together things that make it an argument or even make it reasons. This is claiming that it's like an if then statement when in truth, these are separate reasons. So that's why it has to be either four or five. Um, now, why does it have to be five instead of four? Well, this has to do with the order in which the premises are working. And the way to think of this is the way an argument works is you are making a general claim in this case that cars are very bad. And then your conclusions, uh, your premises for it are going to be a little more general or a little less general. So you have a very general claim and then a bit less general of premises. And then the serial premises that support that are going to be more specific things that prove your more general premises that prove the very general conclusion. So the fact that 38,000 Americans die in a car crashes each year, that is the, the proof that cars are dangerous. Cars are dangerous is the general claim, and 38,000 Americans dying a year is the proof that those cars are dangerous. It is, in some sense, 38,000 Americans die in car crashes a year is just to put into more specific words that cars are dangerous, while it doesn't go the other way. That cars are dangerous does not necessarily mean, like that is not proof that 38,000 Americans die a year. It could be that if 50,000 Americans died a year, that would still mean cars are dangerous. It's rather it goes the other way. And same thing with this last one. It's that the cars are releasing the emissions. It what causes them to be killing the environment. So that's why it has to be number five. Are there any questions on that one? That one was a little tricky for people. Any computer people, human people, anyone have any questions on that one? All right. Um, so people online, I am now going to type out the correct answers for this in the chat because I don't have it written here. And rather than just referring back. So A equals see if I can remember this. It was two, B equals seven, C equals one, D, D, E, F, G are all any combination of three slash four slash five slash six. And then H was eight. So I'm typing out the answers there in the chat to anyone who wants to look. So this is the correct answer. The correct answer was going downwards, two, seven, one, three, four, five, and six in any order. So it could be three, four, five, and six, or six, five, four, three, or three, five, four, six, any of them work. And then the last one, H was eight. So working through this, one has to be C. Why does one have to be C? Well, one is the ultimate are, yeah, one is the ultimate conclusion that everything else is working for towards. The thing that every that if every anyone said all eight of these sentences, the thing they'd be trying to prove is that fall is the best season. And why is it the case that fall is the best season? And why isn't it the case that fall has the best weather makes it the why isn't two the conclusion? Well, two can't be the conclusion because seven 
and eight have nothing to do with proving that fall has the best weather. It would make no sense to say that fall has the best weather is your overall conclusion because the quality of the holidays is irrelevant to the quality of the weather. Those are separate things. The only thing that ties everything else together is one. So one is the main conclusion. Now, what are the two main premises to prove one? Well, those are two and seven. So it's why is fall the best season? One is that fall has the best weather. And the second thing is that fall has good holidays, which means that fall has the best weather goes in either A or B, and fall has good holidays goes in either A, the other of A or B, because those are the general reasons to think fall is the best. Now, fall has the best weather is going to be in slot A, and then D, E, F, and G have to be three, four, five, and six. And what this is saying is this is a set of four linked premises that together prove that fall has the best weather. So the four reasons combined are fall, that there are only four seasons, and that the other three seasons are bad for some reason. So if you accept all of that, there's only four, the other three are bad, then it's got to be that fall has the best weather being the following from that. So that's why A is number two, and then three, four, five, six go into any of these slots, D, E, F, and G. Then the reason that seven goes in B and eight goes in H is again the same reason we were talking about with serial premises before. Um, the, <laughs> the serial premises from before are that um, the fact that Thanksgiving is in fall is your reason to think that fall has good holidays. The fact that in a certain sense, if fall is in, Thanksgiving's in fall, it's a guarantee that fall has good holidays, but it doesn't go the other way. Winter also has good holidays, but that's because it has all the winter holidays. Thanksgiving being in fall is the reason to think that fall has good holidays. So that's why B is seven and eight is H. Does that make sense to everyone? Are we doing okay with this one? All right. Um, then we had the fallacies. So this one, um, basically, just to be clear, the way the grading worked on most of these is basically if you answered a question, you got at least a point on anything. I wasn't, you. the only way you got a zero on a question is if you forgot to put an answer. So if you got minus five on anything, um, just message me and it means I took off too many points. And again, if I miscounted or anything, just message me. If you have any questions and you're like, I disagree that you took off points here just message me and I will work something out. And we can find a better answer. Um, I'm happy if we work through this to give people more credit or anything. I'm not trying to be a stickler on this. And if you give me a good case, I'm happy to work with you. All right. So number 15, um, the correct answer for 15 was that it was either a appeal to authority or it was a, a um, irrelevant premise. Either of those would work. Why was it an appeal to authority? Well, it's an appeal to authority because your, your dad doesn't know anything about aliens. Like nobody knows anything about aliens. You're just talking about what your dad says because your dad is an authority figure. Also, the fact that your dad told you so is completely irrelevant to whether there are aliens or not. I can tell you there are aliens right now. It doesn't make it the case that there are aliens. So that's why non sequitur. Um, it was not an appeal to ignorance. The reason why it was not an appeal to ignorance is let us scroll down to number 21. The nature of what the definition of an appeal to ignorance is, is that it is an argument in which you are saying something is the case because you don't know it's not the case. That's just what an appeal to ignorance argument is. Now, you could say that maybe what you're doing is appealing to your ignorant father, but that's not what this term means. This is a specific term that what the term means is an argument in which you say, I don't know something isn't the case, therefore it is the case. So an argument like 20 one just is what an appeal to ignorance argument is. Um, so 15 is not an appeal to ignorance because this is just not what an appeal to ignorance argument is. I can see how the term would be confusing if you are approaching it for the first time, but because we went over it, that one's not going to work. All right. 16. 16 was also a fallacy, and it was a fallacy simply because the first sentence is claiming that there are only two possibilities when there are many. I could be the second worst professor ever. I could be the third worst, worst professor ever. So therefore, it's not the case that either I'm the best or the worst. It could be the case that I'm somewhere in between. 
So therefore, this one was an either or or false dilemma fallacy. Number 17 was a terrible question. Uh, I gave everybody credit on 17 because I screwed up the question. Um, I meant to, I intended it to be a small sample size, but it's not worded right for a small sample size. What a small sample size would be, would be if I had said, he said Kanye West, therefore all Americans think Kanye West is the best. That would have been an actual small sample size argument. Um, also, it wasn't quite an appeal to authority unless your neighbor's the president or something like that. So st strictly speaking, the most correct um, Um, so after I'll got it, I'll go back to B and H as soon as we go through these ones on number uh, number fourteen. So um, the reason, strictly speaking, the only theoretically a hundred percent correct answer, which is not the answer I gave in my own head, which is why everyone got full credit. Because if I get the question wrong, it's a bad question. I think strictly speaking, the only correct one hundred percent correct answer would be an irrelevant premise slash non sequitur. I think because I asked my neighbor who the best musician alive is, and the fact he said Kanye West in no way has any bearing to who's actually the best. So that's why I think strictly speaking, um, irrelevant premise is the most correct answer. But again, if you put anything on this, because it was a terribly, terribly written question, you got full credit. If by some like mistake, I took off credit on this one for you, let me know and you're getting full credit all five points on this one. All right, 18. 18 was designed to be somewhat tricky because again, the correct answer on this one, non sequitur slash irrelevant premise. I can see why you'd think there was a connection here because America does have things to do with freedom and we know we like freedom. But if you actually break it down, the claim, this is saying that America is the best nation and it's claiming that America is the best nation because freedom isn't free. Now, you might think freedom isn't free. It might be true freedom isn't free, but whatever that means, it isn't a reason to think that America is the best nation. Um, America, freedom could cost a buck 99 and America could still be the best nation. Like that, those are unrelated. Now, if it is true, if you think America is the best nation, you are very often somebody who, like there is a correlation between people who have bumper stickers and that say freedom isn't free and people who think that America is the best nation. But the fact that the claim, even if let's, for the sake of argument, I'm not actually quite sure what freedom isn't free, strictly speaking, would mean in a truth sense. I mean, I know the sentiment that like, support the troops and positive things about having a democratic government and all, but that, that like slogan doesn't count as a reason to think America is the best. So that one was non sequitur. 19. 19 was, um, 19 was questionable cause. The reason it was questionable cause is that this is just a claim where two things that happen together, one must have caused the other. This isn't a slippery slope. I'm not saying that if this happens, then this will happen. If this happens, then this will happen. And this will happen. This will happen. I'm instead saying these two things happened together once before. So if I were to do it again, if I were to move a second time, the other team will score again. So that's why it's just a questionable cause. Um, 20, the... Uh, this was not a fallacy. So the only people who got this one wrong were those who didn't see the instructions that one of the possible answers was not a fallacy. So 20, not a fallacy. 21 was, as we said, appeal to ignorance. 22, 22, I was thinking of as unrepresentative sample. I was thinking of it as unrepresentative sample because we're asking 100,000 Americans about what they think is the best country in the world. And Americans are generally biased about America. Um, However, if you put small sample size and I took off points, let me know because I also accepted small sample size as an answer because there are 7 billion people in the world and 100,000 is a small percentage of that. So if, I, if you put small sample size and, you want, and I took off points, let me know because I should be giving you credit for that. Um, 23 was either ad hominem or irrelevant premise. And the reason it's ad hominem is I'm calling the dean Amini, and that's supposed to be that they wouldn't know when the finals are, but you know, the person who sets the final date is going to know when the final date is, no matter how nice or mean they are. And then 24 was just a classic two wrongs make a right. Um, you know, punching your boss isn't suddenly okay if somebody else shot their boss once. Um, number one other thing to say about number 21 the reason it is not an ad hominem attack is that you are not 
in an ad hominem attack like number 23, you are bringing up an irrelevant insult about someone to disprove some other conclusion. So in 23, you're bringing up a fact about the meanness of the dean to talk about when finals are. But in 21, what it's saying, that your uncle is definitely a serial killer. You're not saying, you're not using the, the irrelevant fact that your uncle's a serial killer to disprove something. You're not saying, my uncle said it was going to rain, but my uncle's a serial killer, so we shouldn't listen to him. Like, serial killers are able to identify rain levels. Um, what it is saying instead is that um, so it's not that you're using the fact your uncle's a serial killer to draw some other conclusion. It's instead using the fact that you don't know that your uncle's a serial killer to conclude he is. And that's an argument, um, that's an in, uh, appeal to ignorance argument. Are there any questions on those? How many was that? 10? I think that was math 10. Does anyone need me to go over those? Human people or online people? Or I'm, yeah, human people or computer people? People, people, computer people? All right. Gotti asked me to go back to number 14, the big diagram, and talk about B and H. Yeah. So, so let's talk about, again, so let's ignore the entire top half of this diagram. The entire top half of this diagram is forgotten. And if we just look at the bottom, what we have is a set of serial premises. We have a conclusion, namely that fall is the best season. And then we have a premise for it that is leading to another premise. Now, what this is saying is fall has good holidays and Thanksgiving is in fall. What is the relationship between these two? Generally speaking, whenever you give a specific example of something, what the point of that specific example is, is to prove a more general point. For instance, if I say New York City has great sports teams, then the evidence or the proof I'm going to have for thinking that New York has great sports teams, I'm going to do something like say, for example, New York has the Yankees, which is the greatest baseball team in history. Or I'm going to say they have the New York Giants who have won blah, 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 many Super Bowls. Or I'm going to say they have the Jets who suck and are fun to laugh at. Um, so that would be my, those examples would prove the more general point. And whenever you have an example proving a more general point, the example is the bottom serial premise that proves the more general point, which then proves the main conclusion. And the reason is because remember what the point of premises are is a premise is something where if the premise is true, that gives you reason to think the conclusion is true. So it's a matter of thinking what would have to be true if this premise is true. And the fact that something has Thanksgiving is definitely a reason to think that it has good holidays. By contrast, the fact that something has good holidays is not by itself a reason to think it has Thanksgiving because every season has some good holidays. It's rather going the other way where the specific example is proving the more general point. So just generally speaking, the point of examples in any sort of argument is they are providing sub premises. So whenever you see an example and then a slightly more general claim, the example is going at the bottom of the serial list. So it's Thanksgiving is the, the example, which proves the more general claim that there's good holidays, which proves the main conclusion that falls the best. Okay. That, that, make a makes, more sense? that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Does anyone have any more questions on any of these things? Comments, concerns, feelings. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this document then. Um, if I can figure out how. Why is this so difficult? All right, awesome. All right, now I am going to take attendance once more for computer people and for online people. I think Dondre's here now, so I want to make sure I mark you down. Um, so, Dondre, Hannah, Amanda. Do I have Amanda marked down as here? No, Amanda. Amanda Virtual, got you, Amanda. Thank you. All right, so a uh, couple things I just wanna say business-wise uh, to people, people, and computer people. Um, this exam is 20% of your grade. That means that in the grand scheme of things, it is a very small percentage of your grade, which means that basically, if you, got, if you had gotten a zero on this exam, you still could have gotten a B on the semester. Nobody got a zero on this exam. So like grades do not, like the homeworks on the course of the semester are worth much more than this 
one exam was. So um, I think if you include all the homeworks, including the things leading up to the paper, I think the homeworks are twice as much over the exam in the grand scheme of things. So if you haven't done homeworks yet and are behind, get them done. Um, I'll have to take off a couple points at this point, but it's better to turn them in and get some credit than not turn them in at all. Uh, and also, so if you did really well in this exam, first pat yourself on the back, but then don't get cocky. You still got a long way to go. Secondly, if you did worse on the exam than you wanted, don't panic. There's plenty more. The homeworks are worth more. If you've been keeping up with those, get those done. Um, and the final paper is going to be worth more. And another thing to keep in mind is um, the homework that's coming up this week, as I said, if you put in an honest effort, you're going to get full credit on it. Like basically, as long as you don't just like, you know, put your cat on the keyboard and tell it to go, you're going to get full credit. Um, so that's one thing that's going to raise your grade. The final two assignments are related to the paper. There's a thesis assignment and like an outline assignment. Basically, both of these are going to be pass fail. And again, if you put in an honest effort and turn it in, you will get full credit. So you have multiple things where like that's 15 points right there that as long as you put in honest efforts, that's three quarters of the exam grade that you're basically guaranteed to get 100% on as long as you're practicing. The goal of these things is to get better at them, not to do this. So again, if you did worse on the exam than you wanted, do not panic. There's plenty more of the semester to go. If you did great, congratulations. Pat yourself on the back, but you've got you've still got some work to do and get in those assignments if you haven't gotten them in yet. All right. That's all I wanted to say today. I'm going to stop the, rec the recording bit.